So um, I'm not really going to talk about, first actually, I do wish to express my thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come here. Um, lovely place. Um, now I can sort of move on to tell you what I want to tell you about, which is that I'm not really going to tell you about the theory. I'm going to try to argue that there might be some sort of interesting mechanisms that, especially for observational purposes, it could be used as kind of useful benchmark for testing our ideas about the dark section that we don't know, at least in practice, all that much about. So, um, in fact, I had a certain motivation for choosing a title which is a little bit more sort of dark. Um, Confrontational. You can uh, plug it from the store. Now, 
And uh, that actually meant that they had to have been fine-tuned to very special values at very different times in the past because they were all according to different laws as the universe grows. And we do have some ideas for explaining many of the coincidences. And namely, namely our best ideas actually come from inflation and subsequent time of equilibrium where we, you know, assuming something like thermal equilibrium and, you know, some kind of dark matter particle and so on and so forth can actually explain those that have to do with particles. But the one which we really don't understand is dark energy. Okay. And uh, the situation here is clearly desperate. And so, you know, you might say, well, okay, desperate situations require desperate measures. Or at least you might try to probe whether any such need ever arrived. And, you know, in, in I can't resist to show this, okay? Because in a certain sense, you know, when you think about concordance cosmology, you're sort of, you know, getting a picture where, you know, we end up Sorry, inhabiting the, the universe with many, you know, kind of um, well-behaved but strange creatures. But then, you know, you, you also can't help but think that perhaps the situation will be interpreted a little bit more differently. Okay, so instead of, you know, concordance, perhaps you might think of discordance, and that might actually be interesting because it's a bit more eventful. So if you think about it, I mean, maybe, you know, the curse that we are now facing isn't really, isn't really a curse but blessing in disguise. Because, um, okay, the point is that we are now perhaps at a sort of, sort of, uh, at, at a certain level of dichotomy between what we know and what we see. Okay? And that type of situation in physics in the past is usually led to discovery. And that's actually exciting. And maybe, you know, by pushing both our theoretical thought and our experimental uh, 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 fact, we can learn more about the world. In particular, you know, a very good question that we can ask is, you know, just how do we get a small lambda? Is it anthropic? It may be. But is it even lambda? And what is it actually that we need to explain? And so perhaps a possible strategy is to basically leave your theoretical practice aside, be very humble, and learn the lesson from the story of lambda itself, you know, which has been coming and going for over a century ago. And just let the data teach you. And so in this case, you may ask the questions about what kind of, what kind of, you know, at least meaningful benchmark models, toy models, to be designed that you, you can talk about. And so people, people, I, my particular motivation for having started thinking about this issue was that I spoke with my observational colleagues and they kept asking me questions on whether somebody could end up measuring Dark energy, some aspect of dark energy, you know what? In terrestrial, you know, sort of condition. And and you know, if you think about that a little, and there are actually many papers out there that are proposing various kinds of ideas and methods where you know people want to explore dark energy by even non-gravitational experiments. But if you think about it, basically measuring what it's really trying to determine zero point of energy, absolute zero point of energy. And only gravity can really measure at the relevant scale. Okay? Non-gravitational forces, you know, I mean you can always set a constant of some potential and just drop out, okay, if you take when you take the gradient. And it will not contribute to the force. The trouble of course with gravity is that it's weak. And one thing that you know I've sort of recently come up to appreciate even more, having discussed this with Thomas at some point, is that essentially the only thing that you can really see is a tidal effect. And that essentially produces a force that goes in h squared times some characteristic scales describing your experiment, the size and the duration of the experiment. And that is typically too small in a lab. In fact, it only becomes somewhere within the range of observable if you go out to very large scales and look at very, very old experiments, many supernovae and so on. So the bottom line is that <clears throat> non-gravitational physics can directly see lambda. One possibility, though, is if you have some kind of new degree of freedom, so lambda isn't really a constant, but it's a dynamical degree of freedom, like quintessence. The problem with quintessence field is that generically, they're constrained by gravity experiments. Okay. And so the question is, is there some way to evade these theorems and these, these, these constraints? To sort of, you know, play with these models to see what comes up. And so one interesting phenomenon that has been studied by people like the Moore and Poyer, but more recently Hurry and Belfort, 
is this idea of the of, of utilizing the environmental condition. At some point, this is really similar to something we are familiar with from condensed matter physics. If you take an electron in a crystal, its mass there is not going to be the same as the mass in the vacuum because of the fact that it inter interacts with the lattice and so the forms progress it up and shift it to the curve ball. And here the idea is that somehow it's the ordinary method that plays the role of the formants. After all, the universe isn't in the vacuum, but it's still with matter, and if this scalar field in some way interacts with the matter, perhaps some kind of new effect can arise. And so, if you actually want to sort of go to, to some toy model theory for this, you might just imagine having something like a typical Brown's decay, like still a few, let's say, with universal couplings to all kinds of methods so that you maintain weaker coolness for instance, so that you've got no problem with that. And then you can go to the Einstein frame and find these kinds of exponential couplings of the field, some, some scale of field phi to your method if you disagree. And so, in the presence of non zero matter, Stress energy. That will effectively give you something like an effective potential for the scalar field, which in addition to the vacuum contribution picks up this environmental condition contribution, which is the trace stress energy in, the, in this simple, simple realization. And so if you like then the minimum and the mass of the minimum with this effect included are actually going to be different than if you were in the vacuum. In particular, then the mass that you get, the curvature around this equilibrium point. The curvature of the potential around this equilibrium point will, in general, depend on the trace of stress energy tensor, and that is proportional to the energy density of the environment. And so, and so, this, you know, you may actually take this. If you, for example, end up with a minimum where this effective mass is much bigger than the Hubble scale, then please, over short time scales, you may really think of this as a sort of, you know, quasi stationary. Uh, uh, configuration, stable configuration for the field, if you can really ever get it. And so now, now the question is, if you actually consider these kinds of things, what happens if the field sits in the minimum? Both, you know, for the purpose of experimenting and probing, you know, probing this in the lab and cosmological. And so here things get uh, interesting and tricky. First of all, if you look at laboratory phenomenology, you must actually First check that whatever you do to your theory, it will be such that if you go to the minimum international conditions, you'll be able to pass the laboratory, laboratory test. Namely, this will in general lead to some extrascalar force that can be long range if the field is light. It is gravitationally coupled by design. Okay? So, however, the point is, is, that, is that in the environmental conditions, when density is non-zero, the field happens to be heavy due to local effects, then it will lead to some kind of screening effect. Because of the fact that if you like, if you calculate, if you take a probe particle and put it at a certain distance from the source particle, if the source particle is embedded deep in some matter distribution, then the field that the source particle generates will suffer from the Yukawa suppression with a mass that may be big in the environment. And so essentially, Essentially, that will, by, by the time that its field spreads out into the vacuum, where the mass changes and the effect becomes long range, it will have been suppressed by the Yukawa effect inside the matter distribution by an exponent of the effective mass times the size of the distribution. And so the only contributions that will then survive actually will be from the particles in the matter in the source that sit in a certain outer layer surrounding the mass distribution or certain thickness being given more or less by some effective mass, although effective mass is there on the outer surface rather than in the center, because of the fact that field configuration, the background field configuration may be changing as you're going out from the center into, into the exterior. So you got to be careful. The bottom line is that this leads essentially to the bounds which are more or less comparable to the bounds on extracellular forces, because of the fact that lab experiments okay, are done with objects of size, sub millimeter size. And so actually for these things, you know, the, the, the point is that for these things, basically there, there won't be in, in shock suppression and the relevance here is given by the size of the object. And also you have to make sure that if you go from one environment to another, namely from the core of the Earth into the atmosphere, the background field volume doesn't change by too much because it can actually alter effectively the gravitational couple itself. That may, that may that depends in part. 
So here is this kind of picture. So what you do is basically you can forget about the interior of the mass distribution because of the fact that particles in here, again, give a field that drops off exponentially with the distance. And you only get some contributions from the shells around you. Then you go to cosmology. So the cosmological scales are convenient way to write down the equations governing the zero mode of this. It's basically like some kind of scalar tensor theory. Okay, that looks more or less familiar, except for these non-minimal couplings of matter to the scalar two pi. Okay. Now, one thing that you can then check, however, is that if you can ask, okay, under which conditions will this field cosmologically, if it sits in its environmental minimum at large scale, under which conditions will it ever lead to cosmic acceleration? In other words, will it ever lead to cosmic acceleration by itself? Okay? So, for example, if you just assume that this universe is mapped, that the row scales is, is called that method, 1 over a cube. If it dominates, you can then easily see, actually, that if the field sits at this environmental minimum, approximately, the universe will actually not accelerate. All right? It won't accelerate because of the fact that, it, uh, unless, of course, the field is very light out there. If the field is relatively heavy. What happens, is, in other words, if the, if, the, if the vacuum potential is too steep, the field may not be going down too fast just because it's being propped up by this matter fluid. All right? But if the fluid is getting diluted with the expansion of the of the of the universe, the field will essentially behave like a like 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 a like a, a sort of fishing float in a bathtub where the water is going down, sinking along with the level of the water. Okay. So in order to actually check under which conditions acceleration may ever occur, you can formulate sort of generalized for all conditions. These are essentially just a way of stating the inflationary conditions for some generic fluid. What you do is you make sure that basically Hubble constant is roughly constant, that's this condition, and that it continues being constant for about the Hubble time. And in that case, you can actually easily show that if it's environmental minimum, the field mass, the curvature of the potential is bigger than the Hubble scale, the field will not lead to cosmic acceleration unless it is supported by some other some other dark energy. In other words, if you really want to get the quintessence out of this, but you end up with a field that's too heavy, well, you know, then you, it's not going to support cosmic acceleration. You need to do something else. So it's not very economical. Okay, you don't need to go through all this trouble, generically speaking, if in the end of the day you have to put in an extra topological constant, and that of course sounds very bad. So. In other words, if you want to have models like this, then you better find some realization that you need to swallow. And that's actually not easy. The problem is that, for example, in typical potential, let's say powers, right? You'll find out that if you sit in the environmental minimum, the mass of the field will scale as the energy density of the environment. But it will go as some generically as some power of the energy density where the power is less than you need for some generic choice of the coefficient of the power n of the potential. So then you need this effective mass in the terrestrial condition to be about 10 to the minus 3 electrons or bigger in order to pass the subunit of test. Okay? Now how much will that change if you go to very large scales? Well, it will essentially change by the factor given by the ratio of the energy density out there, namely the critical energy density of the universe now, and the terrestrial energy density here. Now, if you then approximate the terrestrial energy density basically by the energy density of the wall, gram per cubic centimeter, that comes to about 10 to the 20 like 21 electromoles to the fourth. And then you remember that the critical energy density of the universe is 10 to the minus 12 energy. Electromoles to the fourth. And that gives you a ratio of about 10 to the 33. A rather interesting and curious coincidence because that's precisely the ratio between millimeter and the half of scale. So that tells you that the field, can, the field mass can change between here and there by at most a factor of 10 to the minus 33 times gamma, 
But remember, gamma is genetically less than 1. It doesn't work. Genetically, it doesn't work. Period. All right? As long as gamma is less than 1. But there is a little exception. The log. Okay? If you take a log potential, you'll actually find that the mass scales linear with the environmental energy. And then, of course, well, why would you ever have a lot of potential and so on and so forth? This is where I have no good answer. I can argue and speculate about radius directions and extra dimensions and conical extra dimensional spaces and so on and so forth, but I'm not really happy about it, and neither should you be. Okay? The situation is a little bit better because you might sort of argue, at least in the theories, where this is really viewed as a, as, a, as a translated type scalar with universal couples to matter, then this is a fine tuning in the gravitational sector alone, having nothing to do with, 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 with the standard model or the particle physics sector and so on and so forth. But that's hardly a, a, you know, a satisfactory argument. But you know, this is, on the other hand, typically what happens in consensus models. So you just say, okay, you know, I'm not going to take it too seriously as a theory, but I'm going to sort of you know, now, uh, admitting and accepting these fine tunings as a necessity, ask what can I, how far can I go with it? What sort of signatures can I get? So then you, you ask, okay, what are the kinds of scales that you need to put in there? Well, clearly, in order to get a topological acceleration at any point, you will eventually need to choose some scale governing the level of the potential energy to be a point of the line scale at all. If you like, that's your why now problem. You're not going to solve that. You put that in there using it as a boundary condition. Perhaps on tropical. You then also need this mass scale, right? If you like the, the you know sort of self-interaction coupling of the scalar to be a further M1. Why? Well, because otherwise you you you, you won't be in the swarm. Okay? You won't take it too big because there are now arguments that, at least in theories, you know, in, 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 in the theories that should be viewed as potential UV completions for our low energy models, there shouldn't be decay rates and coupling constants controlled by mass scales much bigger than the standard Okay, If they're a further function or so, that might be okay. So then you, you go, okay, let's look at cosmic history. What happens then? So generically, you have this effective potential that looks like this. You have pure log, all right? That eventually goes negative someplace when the web becomes a further app. And of course, it would have runaway behavior if it weren't for the method contribution. But in the presence of the method contribution, you'll get this extra piece coming from the background energy density that sort of turns up. And of course, of course, this part is time dependent in general. Okay? Because as time goes on, if the method dilutes in some way, for example, for cold dark method, this will go down the one over a cube, this minimum will be shifting to the right at some rate. But you have to be careful about separating what happens to the minimum and what happens to where the field is located during the solution. So I'll, I'll work with inflation. So let's assume inflation, you know, is a meaningful theory that shapes the universe and makes the way you see it. And then ask essentially what happens to this field during inflation and post inflationary rule. So during inflation, the effective potential is essentially fixed by the inflation. You know, let's assume inflation is more on the proxy and then what on by one. At some high scale. I don't know, 10 to the 13 G years. Then you get the effective potential that looks like this, and you can actually calculate easily the location of the minimum at that time. And find out that the field essentially gets trapped very close to the origin in the field space. With a mass which is actually much, much bigger than the Hubble scale during inflation. Just by the scale. So essentially during inflation, the field just sits there, doesn't do anything. It's heavy, it's too heavy. It's a spectator. It's basically become. Now, after inflation, let's assume you reheat in some way, let's assume you reheat. Efficient. Eventually, after inflation, you end up with a radiation dominated universe with the matter contribution being completely negligible. It's going to be tiny, okay? So, during radiation domination, you can more or less completely neglect 
the method contribution. Furthermore, remember that the potential is 10 to the minus 3 electrons to the 4 times the log. You're close to the origin, so the log itself will be some number of order, I don't know, 100, 1,000. But it's not going to be of order 10, you know, to 10 to a lot. It's not going to be of order of the Hubble scale during the play. So essentially, or, or, or immediately after. So during radiation epoch, immediately after the question, you can actually entirely forget about the potential as well. So you end up with a field which is basically behaving more or less like a massless field after, after this, this piece disappears. So you see suddenly what happens is four lambda just melts away. The lambda piece melts away. You get radiation. But remember, the, the effective potential is a trace of the energy density. And so whatever uh, rope you put in here, you have to multiply by 1 minus 3 W. Well, for radiation, 1 minus 3 W is 0. So radiation does not contribute to this because there is no formal thing. So what happens, simply by every partition, you can estimate how much kinetic energy the field will have after it's released. And it will partake. But the, the, by its universal couplings, it will end up with carrying away some fraction of the cosmological constant before inflation energy. And then you can actually estimate, once the field starts and starts evolving more or less like a, like a free massless field during this radiation epoch, how far in the field phase, space it will travel. Well, what's going to happen to it is that it will end up eventually dissipating all of its kinetic energy fast. Because as you know, for a massless scale of field kinetic, the energy density scales down as 1 over a to the 6. So the field value, the, field, the, the phi dot scales as 1 over a cubed. And, and essentially, just because of Hubble friction, the field will only travel a finite distance and it will stop. Okay? How far? Well, it will go out to about M1. That's actually universal space. Okay. Now, at that point, and the kinetic energy density is gone, more or less, the, field, the potential is there, it's small. It wasn't doing anything. All right? It just sat there and kind of got built up a little bit, having stored a little bit of leftover potential energy in the field after the field stopped at some value for the empire. And you can estimate it basically by putting in the final value of the field, not maximizing it more or less by this. And remember that we've chosen n to be a quarter m1 up by some number of quarter one, or maybe a tenth or something like that. Right? And then, of course, that means that the log is a quarter one. So you end up with a quarter due to your fine tuning. This is, like I said, remember, right? This, this is not a prediction. Okay? This is putting in y now as a boundary condition. Because I've chosen this to be 10 to the minus 3 electron volt. Alright? It'll get to, to the value of the dark energy density now, having been put there immediately after inflation. And then it'll just sit there. And it'll be very patient. It'll sit and wait because its mass there, because the potential there is very flat, its mass there will be much smaller than the Hubble friction throughout the radiation year. So the field just sort of happily sits there and does nothing. Now, well, not completely nothing, you know, it may fluctuate here and there, but mostly nothing. Now, that also means that basically during the early epoch, the effective coupling, gravitational coupling, that massive particles see, will be actually shifted away from its terrestrial value because, because this coefficient is of order 1. <coughs> So, but it won't be shifted by too much. You can estimate that the maximal difference, maximal ratio of the effective nucleus constant then and now is about a fourth root of the natural, the base of natural logarithm. It's about, you know, 20% difference. Now, this could in principle affect nuclear synthesis, but remember, during nuclear synthesis, the universe is still radiation dominated and radiation doesn't see this. In fact, I should have added the reference. There was a paper by the Moore and Northwither, in fact, looked at this at some level. So even, even, even if you actually look at the literature for what are the allowed bounds on how different nucleus constant was at VDM as opposed to now, well, it depends who you ask. Okay, different people tell you different things, but it can range between 5 and 20% difference. 
But again, remember, this is going to be only seen by matter, and matter as the time the nuclear synthesis is actually a small part. So you don't expect too much. Now, I should also mention, presumably bounds from the Auckland reactor, natural reactor, should be more or less trivial, because by then, after, you know, that, 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 that only started after the Earth is already condensed. And presumably, by the time the Earth is condensed, this field has fallen, at least locally, back to its terrestrial minimum, pulling the G-Newton down to its flat level. So then you go into the matter universe. Well, you know, eventually matter will overtake the radiation you wind up, you know, after radiation matter transition at about an electrical temperature, the universe will start behaving as a matter dominated universe. Okay? Where you know structures may begin to form. Now, the potential will change again. You are now going to start getting, you know, again this sort of environmental minimum. It's not because of, of the fact that now the, the matter contribution will become prominent. And that, that will happen at some location, shifted away from the origin, but still sub quantum. Okay? As long as the matter energy density, remember, that happens from the point of our when matter density is about electrons to the fourth on. And this is only this is only 10 to the minus 12 electrons to the fourth. Okay? So initially, at the matter era, the minimum will sit at about 10 to the minus 12 of the point. Not bad. But the field doesn't sit there. Remember, the field got placed elsewhere. Okay? By inflation, by post, by post inflation revolution. It sits at the lower order and plus. So what does it do? Does this field fall into the minimum immediately after the minimum form? The answer is actually no. Because if you choose this parameter alpha to be less than 1, Essentially, in order to be in more, you know, to have the fields coupling to matter to be slightly subgravitational and make your, your life easier in terms of passing the lab bounds, that will actually guarantee that even during the early time in the matter era, the field will still remain in slow roll because its effective mass, where it sits, not in the minimum, but where it sits, will continue being smaller than the Hubble scale during the matter. That is guaranteed by choosing, let's say, alpha to be less than a third. You actually need to do a little bit better than that. And that will go on as long as the rho is bigger than mu to the fourth. So as long as you are sort of in, not quite yet, why not? Now, when structure begins to form, in some regions of the universe, however, Structure will start forming, and you're going to start getting, you know, proto galaxies and so on and so forth. There, the local matter density will shoot up. As it shoots up, in these regions of the universe, the matter density will then actually change the effective mass of the potential and make it much bigger than the local Hubble scale. And in these, uh, these regions, inside the potential wells created by inflation, where matter starts agglomerating, the field will unfreeze and uh, it will start oscillating around the bottom. So as the evolution continues, in these regions of the universe, this field will actually change and start behaving like cold dark matter, and its energy density will scale as 1 over a cube. That means the cube value, its potential moment will scale as 1 over a to the 3 power. And then we can actually estimate by how much in those regions of space the field value will change away from the m plus. It starts at m plus. Right? It changes as a to the three halves, and between then and now, a, a grows by a factor of about 10 to the 5. So basically, the field will drop down by about a factor of 10 to the 8 or so. That's good because it's actually important for some intrinsic working, inner works of sort of the communion mechanism. It's actually very important, otherwise, you know, the whole thing will fall. Okay. And then what happens? Well, look, eventually, even at the larger scales, the energy density of matter dips below mu to the fourth. Well, at that point, at that point, the potential contribution starts to dominate. At these scales, at, at these scales, field is still suspended in slow row on a slope of a logarithmic potential in the region where the potential is flat. So a little bit of cognitive acceleration begins. Then you have to ask. Well, okay, you have, you know, you can estimate that easily, of course, remember the potential that is avoiding you to the port, that's chosen to be just right. You can compute the mass there in this regime, and you find, of course, that the mass is 
you know, having, having chosen Alpha to be some gravitationally coupled, you have also immediately found that the log has sufficient, su su sufficient with plot regime. So you're going to be in slow order. As long as you choose this parameter alpha to be, let's say, less than about uh, 1 over 4 square root of That's roughly speaking for me. Now, you need to, of course, make sure that the epoch of acceleration lasts long enough, meaning at least one half of time. Right? Now, you might have to say, well, you know, why wouldn't? Because after all, in this regime, actually, you can calculate the effective mass of the field to find out that it goes as 1 over 5. So, as 5. Remember, you are on the log potential, which has a runaway, and that that means phi during this era, as it starts rolling down, is actually getting bigger. So you're getting more and more in this slow regime, right? But not indefinitely, because of the fact that potential eventually vanishes. So you have to make sure that be between where inflation left you and where the potential vanishes, you have enough space to go to produce an info of slow Beyond this point, the potential will change sign, and as we know from recent work by Andre and Renata and collaborators, the universe, such a universe could even be collapsed. So you can then solve these equations in slow roll regime and, you know, putting in the appropriate parameters, find out, you know, what it takes okay, to get a slow roll inflation more or less. So you're here, okay, this is the picture, this is where inflation left you. This is dropping off rather rapidly. So, but, but the potential is relatively flat. And you're rolling, rolling, rolling down towards the minimum, sorry, towards, towards the zero, and eventually there, you know, acceleration will see. So you need, you need one info, right? That means basically that the duration of this epoch, which you calculate by using four all times the Hubble parameter, now needs to be for the one or more. And then you can find what is your second fine tuning that you need to make in order to ensure this. You need to take this mass scale. To be basically bigger than, you know, some approximately, you know, two times one scale. In fact, you can then take this and the condition of positivity of the potential to get a, a kind of bound on alpha coupling, okay, of the field to, 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 to the matter side. Just combining the inequalities, the floral condition and the flatness, of, I mean, the duration of inflation and the flatness of potential. And that will then tell you essentially that the parameter alpha is bounded, all right? So, so, so this is this is the flatness of the potential, and this is this is to be basically at a sufficiently far away from zero. It's bounded by this ratio. So, if you then go by the rule that you shouldn't take any cutoff to be much bigger than the Planck scale, but you know, so to, let's assume it to be ordered there, but not too big. That will actually place a bound on parameter alpha, the coupling, to telling you that it's essentially somewhere of order of 10 or so. And that's actually rather interesting. That's rather interesting, all right? Because of the fact that it tells you that this field shouldn't be too weakly coupled. If it's too weakly coupled, if alpha is, you know, a hundred or a thousand or something like that, then you can probably, for all practical intents and purposes, forget about hoping to see it from the line. Because it would lead, if it ever leads to effect, and in fact that would be too weak. That, the reason is essentially that it's coupling, you know, in some linearized order goes up parameter alpha divided by the default. You can actually also check that its mass goal is proportional to alpha. It's basically a tenth of alpha times the electron mass. So, you know, that's not quite the regime that can be probed by tabletop experiments now. But in principle, that might be a kind of sweet spot for some of the future design. And then you can also ask the question, well, you know, how would you see this in the sky? Well, if you, you know, inflation, in acceleration will see when phi becomes m. And that means, if, you, if that's not too big, that means that basically, during this cycle, dark energy in principle will be changing. You're not, in other words, you're not going to get much more than an e -fold. So the equation of state in principle should be different in minus one. Furthermore, furthermore, so what you should be looking for is some kind of signature, you know, in the sky, like a supernova or something that might lead to W different from minus one. And also, in principle, what will happen is that you see that in, in, in the structures that are collapsing, they'll start with phi much larger than terrestrial bodies before it disappears. Okay? So in these regions of space, in the initial moment, okay, effective Newton's constant will look a little bit bigger 
If you don't know that neutral constant is bigger, you might misidentify that as having a little more dark matter in some way. Okay? So you might sort of look for such anomalies correlating W different from minus 1 and a little bit of excess of dark matter in one of the Now, why, 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 you know, let me summarize here. So to stop here, like I told you, as, as, as right, right off the bat, I really don't think that this is a well, you know, motivated model from the theoretical point of view. But things like this might be useful benchmarks to actually just poke and throw and let the data teach us a little bit more. You know, if things like this are really true, then of course you sort of, you know, go and start questioning everything you know about the world. But if you can rule th out things like this, then you sort of, you know, re restore faith, okay, in things that you may already believe. So in a certain sense, you might argue it's a really good situation. I mean, bottom line that you want to ask is, you know, I mean, we, we have all these successes of general relativity. But then, you know, there is this still sort of question that's lurking, which is, do the successes of general relativity require general relativity itself? Because if they do, then you must deal with general relativity's greatest failure today, cosmological quantum problems. Okay, and maybe in that case, I certainly believe if you have general relativity at large scales, arbitrarily, arbitrarily large distances, then I see no way around the problem. Because of, you know, some way of thinking about this in terms of unimodular gravity and integration constants and the fact that general relativity fails to provide you with a selection principle for itself. Now, perhaps you could avoid the problem by, you know, changing gravity at, at large scales. And, 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 you know, that's not clear by any means, and because usually this introduces new degrees of freedom, and these new degrees of freedom introduce too much new physics, if you like, more than you want. So, you know, looking for models where some of these may be under control could be interesting. In principle, you could, you know, use them to compare with the data and to expose the coupling with it. Very important question, which with gravity is extremely tricky, as you know. And also perhaps actually test what might be the dangers from any new forces if such as this. So anyway, uh, let, let's just you know leave it to this note that you know with more work maybe we'll end up discovering something truly really interesting and hostile there. Thank you. Questions? Yes. I actually one as an observer. Based on your previous slide, which is correlation between W minus uh, EV to minus one and, and dark matter, have you thought, I mean, would like condition lensing, do you think would be a probe for this kind of correlation? So, well, it could be. In fact, you know, my motivation for this sort of arose from discussions with Tony Tyson and you, you know who's that. But I, I, I will say that we haven't really thought out, you know, the detailed consequences of things. I mean, to me, it was a surprise that something like this does, even seems to exist at least at the level of the background. Okay. Yeah, like I told you, right now, I, I, I've told you that as the opening line. Theoretical motivation for this is simply the statement that I don't know. I, I choose to I choose to declare complete ignorance and agnosticism about gravity. So particle physics models will, will not give it. The ones at least that you know I know of, okay? Generic the transition. I mean there are problems in the transition from one to the other. Well, you know, it's actually with exponential problems. With exponential potentials, one of the things that, that you can sort of find by arguments like this is that they, on their own, you actually not need to slow down. In other words, if you want to get slow, you will have problems with lab test or vice versa. If you if you pass the lab test, you won't get the slow. Yeah. Okay. Um, they can rule out models, but not mechanisms. I'm sure. I am sure that many of these models, you know, in, in a certain sense, these are these are sort of 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that with these, you may end up constraining or ruling out many of the forms of potential that people can write down. But to my knowledge, not all. So, you know, there are certainly bounds. In a certain sense, to me, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. To me, the idea is that, you know, if you think about this, there is essentially like a phase space of theory, so then you're essentially going to start cutting out chunks of it and excluding it by the way. Any other questions? 